Hi guys, my name's Colin and I'm an addict. Um, let me rephrase that, okay. Hi guys, my name's Colin and I'm a little bit more than an addict, okay. I got clean in prison, actually got clean in prison. It was my um, sixth prison sentence. I did six and a half years in 27 different prisons during a 17 year career as a criminal um, intravenous heroin and amphetamine addict okay so it was the jail that gave me bail all right the jail was my bail from the chaos the anarchy the lying the cheating the stealing all the blah blahs i got clean in jail i came out of jail six months clean i got clean in jail at about 20 past eight in the evening on the 17th of june 1993 so i've been clean just over 27 years Okay, I um, started, I founded, I became an addiction specialist, officially became an addiction specialist in 2005. Um, when I came out of jail, I, I knew I was a counsellor. I knew I was a counsellor before I got clean, okay. But I had a spiritual awakening and I didn't realise that I was waiting for the spiritual awakening, all right. And then when the spiritual awakening came and I knew, I just knew that this is a new beginning. I'd been in and out of the rooms for six or seven years. I'd been in and out of like four rehabs. I say four rehabs, I did four stints at rehabs. I went back to the same rehab twice, twice. Okay, so the long and the short of it is, I had a spiritual awakening and at about 20 past eight on the Thursday, it was a Thursday night, a nice summer's night in the prison down on the south coast of England. And it was like a light being switched on. I've been clean ever since. And I've not just been clean ever since, the cravings left me at that moment, all right? Um, I knew I was gonna be a counselor. And then when the freedom came, I knew I had to get used to my freedom before I started counselling people. And I knew I had to go into full-time employment and do a job like the rest of the world, life on life's terms. And so I went into work in an iron foundry. It was hot, it was dirty, it was smelly. I didn't enjoy it, but I was clean. I was clean, man. I was going to sleep clean. I was waking up clean. I was going to meetings for the right reasons. All right, I, I, for the first four or five years, I was going to the meetings because my sponsor told me to go to the meetings. And I was getting my identity from his information from him. And I was getting my identity from you guys. I needed you guys to tell me I was okay. And I never liked the fact that I needed you guys to tell me that I was okay. So when the light came on on the 17th of June, 1993, I knew I was okay. I knew I had a lot of work to do. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about now. I just wanna share a little bit of my experience, strength and hope in this horrible time of COVID-19. I see lots of Facebook posts going around for addicts in recovery and addicts, desperate addicts and all that kind of stuff. And I can't sit back with this man. I can't sit at home. I've got a beautiful house on the south coast of South Af on the coast of South Africa. I'm married to an attorney. Got two fantastic kids, and I've just closed down because of COVID. I've just closed down a what turned into an internationally sought after private sector addictions treatment clinic. Okay, I reached the peak of addictions counselling. Okay. And it was going well, man, we're all right with it. I'll get a pension out of this, so I'll just crack on. And when I get to the age of 60 or something, I'll hand it over or sell it and I'll retire. COVID-19 had another plan and we closed it down in March. And now we've got, I'm, I'm still in, involved in addiction counseling and mentoring, all that, all that nonsense. But um, what I wanna do for you I want to offer you one of the lectures from within my treatment center and I've kind of adjusted it for men and women who can't get to the meetings man they can't they can't they can't interact with recovery with skin on okay and so here's me speaking into a camera 
um, hoping that I might be able to just scratch one or two of you where you're itching at the moment. There's a guy in Manchester messaging me. Have you got any help? Can you help in any way? Is there any other alternatives? I've got guys in Belgium and Holland. I'm doing all right in the recovery and, and in um, the counselling. I don't want to call it counselling anymore. I don't want to be a counsellor anymore, okay? I just want to be another pilgrim, all right? Um, but the, the fact is I've accumulated quite a lot of qualification, addiction counselling qualification, blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to talk to you. Um, I hope I can speak into your struggle. That's what I want to speak into. I want to speak into your, into your struggle. Lots of people relapsing because of COVID-19, all right? Or let me rephrase that. Lots of people are choosing to relapse because of COVID-19. And when COVID-19 kicked in, it was like, yay, we've got a reason to not go to the meetings. That's how sick we become, all right? I'm gonna tell you a short story of a guy who um, I'm gonna use this lad as an example with his permission. I'm gonna keep his name and face out of it, but I'm gonna send this guy's story global for the recovery community because um, it's a very, very dangerous area. It really is. This guy comes to my facility. He's been in about 24 rehabs, all right? And none of his, his wording was, I've been in 24 rehabs and none of them worked. Like the rehab's supposed to get him clean and sober. I got clean in jail. Okay, so lots of terminology that people use when they come. Done, it, it doesn't matter. It, the geographics don't matter. All right, I got clean in prison. I buried my sister in recovery, okay? And my um, recovery was never once compromised. I buried my dad, my hero in life in recovery. And my recovery was never once challenged, vulnerable, shaky. When you clean, you clean, all right? And um, having had that spiritual awakening, I do believe I can get through anything now. COVID, there's one thing that really worries me, man. When I look at my kids, my, my kids, my, my, my babies, and I think, God, what happens if something happens to them? So I cannot tell you I'll get through anything. Oh, when I look at my babies, man, and I go in and look at them, they're 13 and 16, and I've got one in England at 30 something, they're my babies. And if anything happened to them, you know, it, it's, that's my scare, that's, that would be a, that could possibly be a, an Achilles heel for me, but I, I still believe, yeah, I could probably get through it, man. So, relapsing because we can't get to meetings means you're gonna relapse at some point, in my opinion, all right? But it does, if you have relapsed, it doesn't mean you have to stay in the relapse. And I wanna try and help you understand something about relapse, because when you fully understand relapse, relapse is no longer an option, okay? When, you've, when you really get to, to truly understand at a subjective level, you know, we've got the 12 steps and the 12 traditions on the walls in each of the meetings, and there they, there they hang from one to 12, from one to 12. But the one to 12 and one to 12, they are only the objective criteria for the recovery program. You wanna know what the recovery program's like? Well, you read the objective criteria, all right? And we can read that objective criteria 10, 15 times a week, 90 meetings in 90 days, 90 times, 90 times. And you can read the objective, you can memorize the objective criteria. But until the objective criteria becomes a subjective reality, becomes a lifestyle, until the program starts to work me, I'm vulnerable, okay? So what I wanna do, as you hear that, I hope it makes sense, man because some of you get discouraged and disillusioned because you're going to the meetings and you're doing it and nothing's really changing, blah, 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 okay? So what I want to talk to you about in this period of isolation, enforced isolation, is relapse is not, uh, cravings is not a relapse. I, what I've learned about freedom in recovery after that spiritual awakenings that my cravings were actually my higher power, all right? And it was inevitable that they were going to be my higher power, my higher power, because I'm conditioned 
to crave. I'm programmed to crave. Let me talk you through this PowerPoint presentation, okay? Conditioned to crave. I'm looking for my what's it for the thingy, all right? Conditioned to crave. Classical conditioning, listen to this. Uninvited stimulation to the bottom of the foot can trigger, all right, a uncontrollable ch uh, chain of events. You know, when you, you might be lying on a settee with your feet up and your beloved walks past and just, just strokes down the middle of your foot and it's like, it triggers a, tr a chain of events. There's usually a sharp intake of breath, <gasps> all right? And then without even realizing it, the chain of events goes as far as the bending of the knee, a twisting of the ankle, and a curling up of the toes. Just from that finger down the middle of the underside of your foot. It's a classical reflex. This classical reflex is the conditioned response of nerves and neurons activated by the receptors by that line down the middle of your foot, those nerve endings that actually get tickled. It's, it triggers this sequence of events, okay? In that context, you're actually conditioned to respond, to react, okay? Classical conditioning. It's called classical conditioning. And we live a life of classical, within classical conditioning. Let me give you 10 examples of classical conditioning, blinking. You know, somebody walks past you and just lifts their hand up, you blink, all right? Squinting, when there's the sun's in your eyes. I've got light shining in my face at the moment, and I've just, I've got used to it now, but in the beginning I was, I used to squint. It's classical conditioning, coughing, all right? We get a little tickle in the back of our throat. <clears throat> it's classical conditioning. Sneezing. I get it. Uh, I suffer from a little bit of hay fever in the early evenings at certain times of the year. I'm, I'm not sure what's going on with pollen. I'm not interested. I enjoy a good sneeze. It's, it's, I, I don't know. I just enjoy it. I don't know why. I'm a little bit weird. 27 years clean, but that doesn't mean you can't be weird. Okay, so sneezing is classical conditioning to pollen tickling the, maybe the tickling the hairs inside the nose. Yawning when we're tired. Or there's a, I think it's something to do with the starvation of oxygen. <sighs> and then when you see it, you yawn. It's, we're classically, con classically conditioned. Swallowing. I do a lot of lectures. And halfway through, le halfway through outbursts, I've got to stop, swallow, and then carry on again. Standing up when my wife comes into the room, or if the queen walked in, I'd stand up. All right. When my when my missus comes into the room, into, if, if she comes into my office, I'll stand up and greet her. All right. When my I go to watch my youngsters in races at school, I've got a daughter. She can run like the wind. And when she crosses that line, whatever position's in, whatever position she's in, I can't help it. I just applaud. All right. And then when if I see my little boy, uh, my son score that special kind of goal where I know he did that on purpose. I smile. It's just, I'm classically conditioned. And if I see a mate or I've got friends and they're leaving, I wave. We're classically conditioned. All right? Conditioned to crave. If you've become chemical dependent, chemically dependent, you're actually conditioned to crave. And there are numerous triggers that will create the cravings. We have triggers for cravings because we're conditioned to crave. It's okay to crave. It's like wind. It will always pass. Okay, let's have a look at 10 triggers for cravings. Loneliness, stress and conflict at home, boredom or lack of challenge at work, anger and the feelings of being trapped. Secret disappointment with the straight life, okay? Secret disappointment with the straight life. Anger at feeling trapped. Boredom and the lack of challenge at work. Stress and conflict in the home and loneliness. These can be triggers for cravings, all right? You know, loneliness, 
wow, it's a monster, eh? I used to go out and I, I nearly got married one day. I nearly got married to one in early recovery. I met this lady and she helped me to not feel lonely anymore. And I thought, I'm going to marry this one. People go out and get married because they're, they're not only, they don't only suffer from loneliness, they've got this intense haunting fear of being alone. So they get clean and sober for three months. They make eye to eye contact with, with Mr. Wonderful or Miss World in the meeting. And then she becomes my higher power. And I, I sit in meetings. I never sit next to her because I can't see her. I'll sit opposite and I'll start, my body language will change towards her. And there's a little nod and there's, how's it going and that? Is everybody all right? You're looking good tonight, girl. It's called bullshit. Basically, that's what it boils down to. And we make people in places our higher power. Why? Because I really don't like feeling lonely. And you know, as a child, I think back, man, and I could sit in my family home, my me, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, no crisis going on, no conflict going on. And we'd sit there, nice warm fire burning away, and we'd be watching television. And I would look around the room and I'd look at my mom and dad and my brother and my sister and feel completely disconnected and all alone, man. I never really felt the way they looked. I didn't feel the way they sounded. And loneliness was like a balloon, like a black balloon on a string, man. Sometimes it wouldn't be so bad, but I would never actually let go of it. I'd never actually deal with it. So loneliness was a big, it was a, a major trigger for me. And it wasn't just loneliness. It was the fear of, I'm going to be alone forever. <laughs> I've got a clue how long ever is, but I don't know how long I'm going to live. But because I feel lonely, it feels like this is it now for the rest of my life. And it's a trigger for cravings. It should be a trigger to go to someone and say, do you know what? I've got this sense of not belonging. I feel all alone, man. Can somebody, for crying out loud, give me a hug? Okay, we don't do that. We isolate, we suppress it, we lie about it, we paint it pink, we cover it in talcum powder, and we act, in, we act like the life of the party. Stress and conflict in the home. Stress and conflict in relationships. Like, man, this is the little story I wanted to tell you about. When I first got clean, I got out of the jail, man, and I joined the fellowships. And I think the um, standard norm was you don't get involved in romantic relationships for the first two years, for at least two years of your recovery. Okay? That first two years is a self-awareness period. All right? Um, now, these days, you guys, you youngsters, you, don't, you shouldn't get involved in a relationship for the first 12 months of your recovery. Anyway... We get this guy, he's been in more rehabs than I've been in prisons, all right? And um, I pick him up off the street, basically, literally, and bring him to the facility, and he goes through our program, and we just offer that it's personal to us. We're ex-chemically dependent men and women. My whole team have got had decades of recovery. Lots and lots of qualifications, degrees and certificates and qualifications. And we scratched this boy exactly where he itched. And he wanted to be like us. All right. And so he made his way up the ranks within the recover the treatment community, became a senior peer. When he left, when his program ended, he had nowhere to go. So we bring him on and he's a recovery assistant. And my feedback to him was just be careful around the women. Just be careful around relationships. And then he comes to me about two months later. He's met this woman. I said, you're not ready, bud. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ah, she's different. And she's this and she's that. He hadn't been in recovery long enough to learn about himself. That's what it's about. And um, he honestly believed that he was something that he actually wasn't. All right. He never got in touch with the fear of never being in a relationship again. He never got in touch with the fear of never being loved, never being caressed, never being held. He didn't, never spoke about that. Captain Recovery, 
all right so he goes into the relationship and he comes onto the team and we end up giving him a bit of a salary etc etc and then slowly 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 about after about four years i start to see the decline i see a drop in his performance i see a drop in his attitude and i start i've got a few friends and i just send a few warning shots about this guy and sure enough that balloon burst with one hell of a noise and one hell of a mess and so the process goes into the relapse all right so this is now a captain recovery who's now back in using days after five years all right and the the relapse hit him so hard he ended up in a psychiatric ward after being a recovery a recovery assistant and a counsellor in an internationally sought after private sector addictions treatment clinic taking people in from all over the world he ends up drawing ducks on a wall and throwing bread at them man he ends up in the psychiatric not that bad but he ends up in a psychiatric ward other people in the same ward are doing that kind of thing and he goes into um this psychiatric ward and they did a fantastic number on him man they did a fantastic job on him and of course he comes out of the um the hospital we reconnect we're never going to judge the guy we don't shoot the wounded but he comes out of the um hospital and i sit down with him and say right what are the conclusions and it turns out that he has been harboring traits of borderline personality disorder he wasn't borderline personality disorder but he had traits of borderline personality disorder it's a re it's relational dysfunctionalism that he didn't even know about he honestly believed that he was the guy in his intentions he had so much about himself that was hidden from himself if he'd have given himself two years working with this level of experience he would have been in touch with that those traits of borderline person whatever it's called and probably be ready for a relationship somewhere around about now in fact he probably would have been married now so you see he's gone into a relationship to hide to cover the loneliness and the boredom of being alone and the anger of feeling trapped and the secret disappointments of not having a, a woman to come home to etc 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 and what he hid from his damsel from his princess what he kept hidden at the start of his relationship came to the surface at the end of his relationship it's, he was really he truly was as sick as his secrets and I'm guessing this young guy could identify with any of these triggers for cravings so he didn't run off to the crack cocaine pipe or the methamphetamine or whatever his drug of choice was when I instructed him not to get involved when this young lady walked into his life it triggered the cravings but it triggered the cravings that um, we all have for members of the opposite sex excuse me and he didn't face it and embrace it he didn't talk about it I'm going to talk about unconditioning soon he was conditioned to crave he didn't give him time he didn't give himself the time and put in the footwork to uncondition okay so there's the first five triggers for craving loneliness stress conflict boredom anger um secret disappointment with the straight life everything we all in the first two or three years of recovery let me tell you something man the first two or three years of my recovery was the most embarrassing period of my entire life I had all the answers. I've had a spiritual awakening. Dun, 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 dun. I was in. I look back and I think, good God. You, 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 you. Okay. Secret disappointment with the straight life. These are just normal for chemically dependent people. Eh? In fact, the secret disappointment with the straight life was one of the reasons we got involved with the drug culture in the first place. It was for me anyway at the age of about eight or nine i lived in manchester and i saw i used to see all the men and women coming off the industrial estate at night exhausted going going on their way home from work dirty from working in the foundry horrible working conditions and i looked at them in at the age of about eight and thought i'm not interested man i'm like if that's what it's all about is that is that what i've got to look forward to so by the time i get to 16 or 17 <sighs> 
and you guys welcomed me with open arms and we had to walk together and talk together and dress the same and all that name it name it name it here's another five triggers for cravings okay not right with god there you go <coughs> not right with god euphoric recall of being high okay depression if you've not suffered depression, if you've suffered from chemical dependency for, a, for any length of time and you've not suffered depression yet, if you've not grieved the loss of the substance, it's not dead yet, you can't grieve something that's still alive. Okay? So triggers for cravings, part two, second set, not right with God. I'll come back to that in a minute. Euphoric recall of being high. Depression, perfectly normal. Please get depressed. If you won't get depressed about your alcoholism, you may never get sober. Depression is a sign of life. Depression is an indicator that you really care about that crap. Okay? Reacti reactivation of denial. That's what happened to this young buddy of mine, eh? Reactivation of denial. Because he wasn't craving crack cocaine, because he was only craving connection, warmth, sex, blah, 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 it was okay, it wasn't that bad. A reactivation of denial. And then secret thoughts of drugging. He didn't, he probably didn't encounter secret thoughts of drugging because whenever any kind of loneliness crept in, there's an answer. He's got an external fix. I got clean in prison. If you can't get clean on your own, you're gonna be really, really struggling if this COVID thing carries on for the next three or four years. You can get clean on your own. All you've got to do is uncondition. You've got to do something about, you're conditioned to crave. I'm going to set you a little task now. Write your life story down. Just start, if you're, if you're on bang up, if you're on lock up, if, we, if wherever you are, if you're on lockdown for lengthy periods of time, it's a perfect opportunity to get into the step work. And I'll talk to that, I'll talk about that at the end. It's a spiritual program, okay? We are made up of mind, body, and soul. Mind, body, spirit. But the spirit and the soul, I don't believe they're the same thing. Okay? If I, if I, listen, to, if I listen to Bob Marley, I, I can get right into it. And it kind of... If I listen to um, certain types of music, it kind of breathes into my soul. Okay? But that's not spiritual. Spirituality is through prayer and meditation, not music. Being attracted to certain types of music, that's soulful. It's not spiritual. Some meditative music can help you into a condition of prayer and meditation, okay? But the difference between the soul and the spirit are quite drastic. And we really like the soulful side of life. Please don't neglect your spirituality. This is a spiritual program. You can't, you can't solve a spiritual problem with reggae. <laughs> okay? So, not right with God. Step three says, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him, as we understood him. I don't understand my God. I never want to. I just rest in the assurance that he understands me. I say he, I choose to say he. I need my masculinity to be understood by my God, okay? And I also have a feminine side as well. I'm quite a poet and I can really express my heart like an artist in poetry. There's a beautiful feminine side of me as well. So when I say, when I address my God as he, I do it as a father, I do it as a son, I do it as a brother, because I need that masculine identity to fulfill my masculinity. In this God, absolute masculinity. In this same God, absolute femininity. And this God is understands my character. And I need a God to understand my character because I've got some character defects that I'm going to be talking to him about later. We'll get to that just now. Okay? So 
if you are really struggling and angry most of the time and craving most of the time and maybe systematically relapsing, I'm going to challenge you, man. Reassess what you believe. All right, we'll get to that just now. We're conditioned to, great, to crave, man. This is what happens, euphoric recall at being high. And we remember that wonderful influence of the substance as it overwhelmed our spirit and our soul. And it felt like we're arriving home. You weren't arriving home, you were becoming bastardized. Recovery fixes everything, my brother, my sister, everything. Beyond your wildest dreams. It goes beyond when you've gone behind your wild, beyond your wildest dreams. It keeps going beyond even the, which is ridiculous. We need unconditional reconditioning. Unconditional, we need unconditioning. We are conditioned to crave. So we have to go into these triggers that cause the conditioned reaction to crave. And we have to uncondition, we have to take off before we can put on. We take off the old in order to put on the new. Conditional reconditioning, how do we do that? We admitted we were powerless over our addiction, over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. I personally not keen on the, the, um, the hyphen. I think step one should just land on, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction. For me to accept powerless over my addiction was crystal clear. As soon as I was told, man, you're powerless, it was like a breath of fresh air. And then our lives have become unmanageable. I just gave that a glancing acknowledgement. Oh, yeah, 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 life was mad. Unmanageable, my unmanageability stretches into my parenting, my husbanding, my secret time, my sexual um, imagination, my, my violent um, fantasies. It's, it's, it's holistic, my unmanageability was as holistic as my powerlessness over my addiction. That's two different entities, man. And if you just wink at unmanageability, you're probably gonna relapse, man. You're probably gonna stay dissatisfied. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Please hear this, man. We came to believe. That means we didn't believe it at first. We came to a belief. Whatever it was you did believe didn't work. All right, please think about that. Take a look at, take a, do an inventory of everything you did believe. Don't just say, oh yeah, yeah, okay then, I'll try this. That's you blending in, okay? Let's not forget that most of us, we could get a PhD in, in chameleonology. We blend in, we become like the people we mix with. So we admitted we were powerless over our alcohol or our addiction, our lives became unmanageable. Oh yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I've done step one. Yeah, I'll do some written work. That's me done. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Check, done that. Check, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, because I agree with it, it must be true. Without saying, hang on a minute, I don't like the word, I don't like the terminology in this step. Came to believe came to believe that tells me that what I did believe wasn't worth the paper it was printed on well I was a 17 year heroin addict looking forward to going back to prison and I come from a religious kind of school upbringing man I thought I've got it boxed off man I used to go to this particular school and the program said to me everything you believed Colin got you to the brought you to your knees man so we honestly we've got to go through these steps with a toothpick Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. If you create a God that you understand, you are the higher power of the one that you're calling your higher power. We're not supposed to understand God. We're supposed to trust God. And we're supposed, we can actually maybe summon up some faith that this God that I'm about to give my life to is going to have to receive me despite me. Because as soon as I go into a relationship with this God, I'm going to disappoint him. That's all I've ever done. So this God has got to love me and understand me and want a relationship with me despite me. Okay? Step four says we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 
Step five says we admit it to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. The exact nature of our wrongs. Yeah, loneliness, boredom, everything that we just spoke about and more. They're the exact, those are the roots of the wrongs. So when we look at the women or the men that we seduce and the women that we abuse, when we take ownership of our predatory behavior within the rooms, it's almost certainly rooted in the dual crisis of the fear of loneliness and pride. This is, these are the exact natures of our wrongs. This is what we've got to take off. And if you won't face it, embrace it, and share it to death, it's still got you by the short and curlies there. Eh? We're entirely ready to have God remove, or admit it to God, to ourselves, and to another, another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. That's a long step, man. That's, that's, that's half a lifetime, eh? Step six says, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. That's typically addictive, that. Right, I've got this list of defects, God, take them away. Uh -uh. Get specific. We admitted to God the exact nature of our wrong. This is me, I'm greedy, I'm horny, blah, 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 and we unpack each character defect one at a time. And when a character defect is something like greed, as we ask for the character defect to re be removed, we've got to start practicing the opposite of it. We take off, we put on. If we're greedy and selfish, ambitious, selfishly ambitious, we've got to talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and start being kind to other people at the same time without them knowing about it. We've got to start giving in secret. We humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Any God with any sense of common decency is not going to take your shortcomings and whip them out from underneath you. Any God with any common sense is gonna say, no, hang on a minute, Colin, you need to suffer a little bit more because you only want me to remove this shortcomings because it's inconvenient for you. I want you to ask me to remove the shortcomings because you want to change. Unconditional reconditioning. I'm not sure if that's worth anything to you guys. I hope it is. I hope it's maybe helped in some way. Okay? My name's Colin. I'm a little bit more than an addict. Try adding that to your self-narrative. I love the fellowships of NA and AA. It was a heroin and amphetamine addict, but I fell in love with AA. The one part I didn't like was, my name's Colin, I'm an alcoholic, which is true, but I'm also a child of God. I'm, I'm Fred and Mary's lad. I'm Alan and Linda's brother. I'm Haley's dad. I'm Georgia and Nathan's dad. I'm ex-bomb disposal. I'm ex-forces. So my name's Colin, I'm a little bit more than an addict. I hope this has helped. Take care, guys. God bless.